Welcome to a special edition of the Ross Safari Podcast, here to help raise money for Binturong Conservation. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hello, 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 and welcome back to a very special episode of the Raw Safari Podcast. So y'all, if you know me at all, you know that I am obsessed with binturongs. They are one of my absolute favorite species. The logo of my podcast has a binturong on it. That logo is also my tattoo, so there is currently a binturong on my right arm. I own every plush binturong that I have been able to find in the United States, and I actually own two that don't exist really anywhere else because um, I found a person online who was willing to design some small crocheted binturongs for me. So I have one of those, and Zoe has one of those, and then a few of the incredible people at the Greensboro Science Center got those uh, for being so kind and letting me get to know the bintlets. So um, I am crazy about binturongs. And surprisingly enough, I'm not the only one who is that crazy about binturongs. And you know, it turns out that binturongs need our help. So one of those people who is wildly crazy about binturongs is named Kirsty MacDonald. And Kirsty is a zookeeper in Scotland who is currently hosting a fundraiser to raise money for AB Conservation, which is the Binturong Conservation Organization. And um, I have been a fan of theirs for a while. I think they do amazing work. And I am so excited that Kirsty is doing this uh, fundraiser. It is beautiful. It is awesome. It makes me happy. It's a cool fundraiser, too, because it is both a raffle and a sale. You can you can uh, buy raffle tickets to try to win some Binturong merch, or you can just buy the merch directly, and uh, the money goes to AB Conservation. So um, I, I saw this online, and I got very excited, and I immediately reached out to Kirsty, and of course, I was like, yo, do you want to promote this on my podcast? And... Uh, she did. And so here we are with a bonus episode in which you are going to hear all about Kirsty and uh, the animals that she cares for, including the two binturongs that she cared for who, who were elderly and, uh, you know, have since moved on from this world, but who inspired her to do this fundraiser. And um, I'm excited to share the story. I am excited to share the fundraiser. And uh, I'm actually going to be helping with the fundraiser in my own Ross Safari way, you know, other than putting out this episode, which will hopefully help. So all of the details are in the episode. I'm also going to make sure that there are links and explanations of everything in the show notes. And I will be posting stories on Instagram and Facebook so that you can find all of these things go to the fundraiser, get yourself some cool bint merch, get yourself into the raffle and help support these amazing animals. And uh, if you need to be convinced that they're amazing, wait till you listen to this episode and learn all about the two binturongs that Kirsty took care of. It is such a good time. Um, so yeah, make sure you uh, go in with an open mind, open heart and open purse strings. And uh, without further ado, here is my interview with Kirsty McDonald. <laughs> All right, so let's start off by you introducing yourself and telling us why you're here today. Hi there, my name's Kirsty McDonald. I'm a zookeeper, been a zookeeper for about eight years now, and I've just launched a fundraiser for AB Conservation, which is a project based around Binturong Conservation. Yeah, it is. And I am a huge Binturong lover, so I am very excited about all of this. Um, and we will we will definitely talk about your fundraiser and, and encourage people to go and 
uh, help you raise funds by giving you said funds. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm, I'm so curious, you know, binturongs are not the most common animal for people to be passionate about. And I say that as a guy who has a tattoo of one on his, his arm right now. Oh. So, um, you know. Um, <laughs> <That's I'm>, yeah. <laughs> so, so tell me, uh, you know, your journey to, well, we'll talk about your career, but like what made you fall in love with binturongs? I think the fact that they're just so unique, um, you kind of look at them and it's hard to believe that they exist <laughs> in the nicest way possible. Um, the, the sort of black shaggy coat, long tail that also helps them around with balancing, hanging off of stuff. Um, they're agile like a cat, walks like a bear. Um, and the, of course, those little ear tufts as well. Um, they just, yeah, they just look as if they're like something out of a sort of animated film rather than an actual real life animal um and they're just very endearing as well um and i was actually very fortunate um, to get to work with them so quickly in my career and um, they were always kind of the top uh, one of the top animals that i'd love to work with and yeah just about a year in um i was able to to make that come true um and yeah i was even more in awe of them once i actually got to to know them and work with them that's awesome. I feel like a lot of times um, when it comes to animals, you know, you have a dream animal, but then do they live up to the dream is yeah. always the question. <laughs> and it's pretty cool that uh, these goobers did for you. So um, that's that's so cool that you have such experience with them. So um, I know that we only recently uh, encountered each other through this fundraiser. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know you said you were listening a little bit, but um, I'm guessing you don't know this. But like I said, binturongs are one of my heart animals. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look at uh, the the logo for the podcast and everything, um, it, they're one of the four animals on there. I did notice that. Yes. I was like, fantastic logo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And um I, I have met a few and gotten to hang out with some and, and had some shoulder time with the binturong. So I am I am very passionate about these animals and I'm, I'm very excited to swap stories and, and hear all about your experience. So uh, before we get to that, though, let's start off about like who you are and, and your career. So did you always know that you wanted to be a keeper and, and what was your path like? Yeah, so basically... Um... I'd always been sort of the dream to to be a zookeeper, but I never really thought that it would happen. Um, and I was trying to kind of find other pathways. Um, and then it was around about sort of that sort of 13, 14, when you're kind of asked, well, right, okay, start planning your future. What is it that you're actually wanting to do? <laughs> um, and I just thought, well, any path that I'm picking is going to take a few years to get there. So why not go for the, the main aim? Um, and I'd already done some sort of experiences. I was um, at a horse riding yard for years and uh, did some volunteer work and all that sort of stuff. So um, I'd kind of got the start of a good experience just working around animals and the sort of um, the fun side, but also the hard work side. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of knuckled down. And um, I definitely took the longer way around, um, but it was fun. <laughs> um, so I did a couple of years at an animal care college and um, to get some animal care qualifications. And then I went to a uh, university and did a degree in zoology. Um, but within that degree, I actually took a year out and did placements at different zoos um, to kind of build that fundamental zoo experience. And yeah, within the first couple of weeks of my first sort of zoo, uh, zoo internship, I was like, yeah, this is definitely what, what I want to do. And it kind of confirmed that <laughs> then and there. Um, and then, yeah, was very lucky to, in my last semester of, um, of university to get um, a job at um, a zoo. And I've been there ever since. That is awesome. I, 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 I love that. I love how much you put into it too, like <laughs> getting the, um, you know, the kind of pre-university work and then university and all of that. And then, so you said you've been at the zoo for eight years, right? Yes. Yeah. Eight years, literally just last month. So, um, it's been a quick eight years, but also, um, feels like you've been there kind of as part of the, the framework now. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I know. That's, that's a good amount of time. And uh, so was uh, was your time meeting the, the Binturongs when you started working with them uh, your first time meeting Bins or had you had experience with them already? That was first time. Yeah. Um, so it was definitely that sort of excitement moment of, OK, these are obviously one of one of the favorite animals. And um, 
yeah, they they lived up to expectations and more. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that does not surprise. So so who were the binturongs that you worked with? Um, so we had a male called Ali, and um, he was actually by himself initially um, when I started working with him. And about six to eight months later, he was joined um, by a female called Poppy. Um, and introductions with them went great, and they were thick as thieves um, since, well, from then, really. <laughs> All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. That's awesome. Um, and yeah, so tell me tell me about them. Like, make my listeners fall in love with these two. <laughs> so Ali was an older gentleman. Um, he was a little bit more wild in his younger days shall we say um before i started working there mm-hmm. the previous keepers um did some sort of um training with them to help get him used to to the keepers and such because he was a little bit of a a wild thing um and um he he got straight into the way of, of training and really enjoyed it um so when i started um i was lucky enough to to help out with the training and then um took that on in, in subsequent years and yeah, he was always a keen bean. And um, even in his later years, um, so he actually lived to be, um, he was about, well, he would have been 25 next month. So he was a couple months away from turning 25. So he was an old boy. Um, but even in his later years, he was still so enthusiastic for training. Um, and all the training that we did was based around his health care. Um, so as he got older, there was a couple of health ailments. Um, that he might need, such as um, uh, trimming his claws because he wasn't as active um, and also doing a little um, eye spray because he got a little bit of a dry eye. Um, And he was always up for it, um, for jumping on the scales, making sure his weight was all right. Um, And he'd be fast asleep and the second that he'd hear you entering the enclosure, you'd hear his little paws getting up and then he'd be on his way um, to, to go to his training area. So he was always enthusiastic for that side of things. Um, Poppy, she was um, really, she. <laughs> I say that Ali taught me a lot and Poppy tested it. <laughs> <laughs> um, she she was definitely one of those animals that um, you, you had to spend so much time with in order to just get to know her. Um, there's those animals that respond to you straight away and are kind of like, okay, this is great, I'm all in. And then there's those other animals that are like, actually give me a minute here because I'm doing this on my terms and I'm going to decide what I'm doing. <laughs> um, she was much more on that side of things. Um, so yeah, so one of my kind of um, most sort of favourite moments of, of my career is actually spending the time with her and gaining her trust because when she arrived at the zoo, she was definitely one of those animals that was like, I'm just going to stay over here and observe you from over here and you can do your own thing and I'll do my own thing. Um, so definitely building that trust with her um, to the point that it took a long time and everything was done on her terms, but we eventually actually managed to get a weight on her by her walking into a, a crate voluntarily that was sat on some scales. And the first time that she did that um, was definitely like a highlight because it had taken so much to get to that point with her. Um, and at that moment, she, she fully trusted us. Um, so that was definitely a kind of career high um as silly as it sounds <laughs> no not at all no i totally get that i think um you know i think it's it's interesting because a lot of people um you know especially people who listen to this or keepers that i talk to or whatever like yeah it's it's the same story over and over again like as far as training like hey we're training and we're training and training and you know we're doing voluntary blood draws or voluntary yeah. weights or like it's the same thing <laughs> over and over but 
each time it's a different individual animal and you have to take the steps to figure that out. And when it's an animal that's difficult, it means the world, every Mm -hmm. proper, you know, bit of growth is huge. I completely love that. That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah, she was definitely, um, when you, when you got sort of that interaction from her and that willingness, it was, yeah, definitely worth, worth its weight in gold. (laughs) That's awesome. So, um, in terms of these two, you said that they, they got along really well together. What did that look like Mm -hmm. for you? Um, so yeah, so we did the introductions. We started, um, really slow with them in a sort of neutral enclosure. Um, and then we introduced, uh, introduced each other sense to them. And then once we, they were happy with the kind of interactions that they were having, they weren't showing any sort of stress or potential negative behaviors. We started the sort of, um, mesh introductions and, um, yeah, they were, they seemed to be like cool with each other and not showing any sort of, um, kind of, um, dislike to each other. And so we opened up the slides um and they went in and were great um apparently previously um before i was there but the last female um wasn't as keen to have ali around <laughs> she <laughs> she prepared her more or her own space um so ali was often told um where his space was and it wasn't really next to her <laughs> um whereas um poppy was much more like happy to have him around um don't get me wrong there were definitely times where she was like okay, I need some space now. (laughs) Um, But for the most part, they were quite often either in the same area where he would be inside um, a little kind of viewing box and she would be sat on top or vice versa. Um, So they were always pretty close by to each other. Um, And uh, we actually were lucky enough that um, pretty much the first season that she had um, after being um, with Ali, they actually had um, a little Bintron cub. Um, So that was an absolute kind of ecstatic moment as well um, to have a a little one being born as well. Um, And Ali was um, then also the oldest first time dad of Binturongs at the time. Oh, wow. Um, So, yeah, he was um, 19, if I remember rightly. Um, So it was a little bit of a shock to the system for him. Um, He had to to learn how to be dad around a very kind of running about um, active little little Binturong. Um, But they both did great and Poppy was a fantastic mum as well. And um, yeah, we, we were very... Very proud of that little one. And of course, being from Scotland, he was called Haggis. So, oh you know. my gosh. <laughs> Haggis the Binturong. Are you kidding yeah. me right now? That's nope, amazing. No, 100%. And he was born on Burns Day as well. I, I don't know what that is because I'm in the US. But uh, Ro- 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 Robert Burns Day, the day that you ha- you're traditionally meant to have haggis. <laughs> oh, see, these are the these are the cultural differences, but uh, that we get to learn about here by having an international episode. <laughs> <laughs> the exotic of uh, of Scotland, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So, um, oh, I have I have so many so many things, so many thoughts. I'm I'm so excited. So, um. I don't know if you've you've uh, heard this over in Scotland, but over here about two years ago, there mm-hmm. was a zoo that had baby binturongs. And I've seen them written as, uh, you know, binturong kits a lot of the times yes. or binturong yeah. cubs. But two years ago, this one zoo decided to call them bintlets, yes. B-I-N-T-L-E-T-S. And I had never seen that before. And I Googled it and like nothing came up. And then a year later, a couple of other bentlets were born and people started calling them bentlets and it started to become more of a thing. So on my podcast, I run with that. And not only do I call them (laughs) bentlets, but I now call all animals lets. So like a red panda is a red pandlet. I know that's not right, but I don't care. And I do it anyway. <laughs> but um, did you did y'all use the term bentlet or have you heard the term bentlet? I'm always curious about this. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely heard it. And we did use it as well. Um, and um, we also had our own little adaptations as well. Baby binties um, <laughs> as well. But yeah, it's it's nice that the, the bentlet is um, becoming more more popular. Um, I just wasn't sure how how well known it was over um, on your side as well. So, um, but no, it's nice to kind of 
that people are getting so drawn in by it as well that they're wanting to give it these sort of names and and um, attention. <laughs> no, definitely. It's it's really cool. So um, I have a great relationship with the Greensboro Science Center and mm-hmm. they had Bentlets uh, last year, Bianca and Monty. And uh-huh. um, I, I got to see them from the time that they were like still being bottle fed uh, all the way through to now they're like, you know, fairly well grown and out on exhibit and stuff. And I, I there was a phase where I went and visited them every month. It's like a nine hour drive each way. But I went (laughs) and visited them because they are just such amazing animals. And um, I, you know, over over the years, having some cool experiences through the podcast, I've I've even gotten to like, hold a a couple week old bentlet. And it's it's they're such amazing, cool little animals. Um, So so tell me a little bit about haggis. Yeah, they they are really incredible. And we Definitely. Well, Poppy was actually, um, she'd actually had um, bintlets before. Um, so she was an experienced mum. So we had high hopes that she kind of knew what she was doing. Um, but obviously it was her first sort of um, season and then uh, bintlets with us. Um, so we were still kind of figuring out what what's sort of the best thing to do for her. Um, in terms of that individual animal. So we, um, with her being sort of more kind of independent, I know what I'm doing sort of thing, we um, believe that we will just step back. We will do kind of let nature take its course, but we will obviously do do, um, feeds, check the enclosures, all that sort of stuff. Um, But we didn't have any sort of hands-on interaction until um, the little one was about, eight weeks old if I remember rightly and that was when we did the sort of checks and um, microchips and all that sort of stuff Um, but in the meantime we also had um, cameras in the enclosure as well so that we could monitor them because obviously if we're not seeing them when we're there then obviously we still need to know that everything is good and going well Um, so we had cameras in the enclosure as well and we had some fantastic footage um, caught on nails with the the little sort of little bintlets hanging by their their sort of tails and running around after dad who's like okay remember I'm old please <laughs> um, and um, Poppy just being a bit kind of like okay they're awake now <laughs> um, so yeah so we got some fantastic footage um, of that and it was nice seeing that sort of process um, of him kind of finding his feet. And um, yeah, just getting to know the enclosure, getting to know us as well. Um, And eventually um, we got to the stage where we were um, happy with how Poppy was doing, happy how Agus was doing and I introduced the idea of training um, because obviously we want to kind of make sure that the animals can partake as much as they can in their own healthcare. Um, but also he was be um, he was going to be moving on to another zoo eventually, so we wanted to get the steps ready so that when it came to the day, it was just a case of him to the loon into the box and then um, being nice and smooth and um, not stressful for him. And he definitely was the absolute mix of both mum and dad. <laughs> he was curious about training, but also a little bit kind of like, I don't know, and checking in with mum and being like, should I go? <laughs> um, whereas um, when he would see his dad um, interacting with the training side of things, he would get braver and be a bit more kind of like, okay. And then once he realised that actually you get some tasty treats if you just come over here and step into a wee um, box area and not, nothing happens to you, it's all all good and positive stuff. He then became uh, came round to the idea of it and thought, this is actually great, I can do stuff for free treats. <laughs> <laughs> it, it it is amazing how effective that works on on you know uh bintlets and you know humans <laughs> yes yes <laughs> very cool so uh what uh you know to, to to branch away from from bints for a second uh what are some animals that you work with or have worked with other than uh binturongs um, so I've worked with uh, the majority of my, my time, my career has been um, with carnivores. Um, so I've worked with a vir- variety of bears. Um, uh, we've had some Asiatic lions and um, Sumatran Ooh, tigers. Hold on, pause. Asiatic lions. That's really yes. exciting. That's very <laughs> rare. Yes. Um, so yeah, we were actually lucky enough. Um, so we had 
G and Roberta, who were our adults. And during COVID, we were actually very fortunate to welcome um, three cubs with them. Um, so from them, so yeah, so they were um, um, great fun to see growing up over the years. Um, it was a shame that it happened to be during COVID um, because <laughs> me members of the public weren't able to, to see and appreciate them as much. Um, but we were sure to, to put up um, all the, the videos and footage of them all as they were, they were aging. Um, so yeah, so they were um, a fantastic um, little family group. <laughs> oh, that's very cool. Uh, what else? Um, Asiatic uh, short claw daughters um, that are just complete chaos. Um, we have 13 of them. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> I've always um, seen like two or four together. <laughs> yeah, no, mum and dad got on very well. Um, <laughs> and um, <laughs> their last their last letter, um, we were kind of suspect. We were like, oh, I think there's maybe two in there. And when it came time that to the... The, the time they were, were like okay we need to to clean that hole out because they've not moved them for a little bit and we need to go in and do some some uh, cleaning up after them when we opened up that hole and seen six little baby otters lined up in a row <laughs> um, we couldn't really believe it and um, yeah that was already on top of um, eight because we actually had 14 so and we've just moved one on to another collection so um so yeah, they're they're absolute chaos and keep us on our toes, that's for sure. Um and they know that they have numbers on their side as well. Um <laughs> they will do the the distraction technique where some will run up to you on one side and be like, Hey, look over here, whilst the other ones are circling around behind you. Um trying to to have any sort of um flesh. <laughs> they oh, can. <laughs> my gosh, that's amazing. That that must be uh quite the journey every time you're you're there. Yes, definitely. Um, we enter the enclosure with no less than three people. <laughs> so um, it's always a little bit of a kind of like, okay, who's on who's on defense and who's on cleaning? <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, I have heard plenty of uh, animals and species and exhibits and stuff where the rule is, you know, two people have to be there. Yep. But I've never heard three before. And the fact that it's four otters is just yes. amazing. <laughs> yes, believe me, when there's 13 or 14, 14 of them, there's times that you wish there was a fourth person <laughs> um, because it's just absolute chaos and, and they know it as well. Um, so we'll be cleaning the pool and there, there's kind of like a little boundary around the, the t sort of top of the pool where we, we kind of ask them to stay out of. And, um, you know, they'll they'll kind of walk up to the line and be like, will I? And you're like, just you stay out whilst I'm cleaning, please. <laughs> and they'll just, it's like a kid that's kind of like, I can just, I can just step and poke that little bit there. And then, uh, yeah, they're just kind of like, actually, nah, I'll go and play with this instead. And you're kind of like, okay, good idea. <laughs> that's adorable. I, I can't tell you how much I love that. <laughs> so, um, Tell me uh, a little bit about what inspired you uh, to do the uh, the whole fundraiser that you're doing. Yeah, so um, I'd heard about um, AB Conservation um, a few years ago and um, I'd really admired the work that they were doing um, and I wanted a way to find a way of getting involved and helping support them. Um, but you know how life is, especially when you've got a busy work life, before you know it, four years of past and you're, you're kind of blinked and that's it sort of thing so um with um I actually went to a um Binturong conference um towards the start of the year and it was actually the sort of UK's first Binturong conference and um we actually um met a representative from AB Conservation there and it was really great and kind of um it, it refocused you back into that sort of kind of like right, how can we help conservation and help this um, specific conservation project out? And one of the main things was the, the idea of World Binturong Day. Um, so that's actually on the 11th of May. And um, they always try and um, get zoos involved. And one of the main things is trying to get um, the message out to the members of the public of binturongs and exactly what they are and what's 
threatening them in the wild and what we can do to, to help them because quite often, um, as, as you previously mentioned, when someone asks you, what's your favourite animal? And you say, Binturong, they're like, a what? <laughs> because it's just it's just not heard of very often. Um, so one of the things they're trying to do is to kind of make Binturongs more known and um, kind of engage people to, to want to save them as well, um, which I admire and um i'm passionate about myself so um so yeah so in the lead up to um i had some ideas about what to do for wild binturong day um and then sadly we lost um our two um it was both their time and um it was the the right decision and it's unfortunate that that's just the kind of rough part of the job right. um but um with them now gone i wanted to do something almost in their memory um, so I came up with this idea of the fundraiser and um, I'm not the most artistic people uh, person in the world, um, but I do enjoy sort of little crafty things and stuff like that. So I came up with some ideas of different sort of Binturong merch um, because it's not something that you can have widely available. Um, and yeah, the, the reception that I've had so far has been amazing and um, all the profits are going to to AB Conservation to help out with their their projects and try and um, continue to to save save this fantastic species. That is wonderful, but I'm going to contradict you because <laughs> uh, the art that you did is actually awesome. Like I, I really, I got so excited about this because it's, you know, supporting a, an organization that I love that is, that is trying to save Binturongs, obviously. <laughs> um, yeah. but also because it all looks really good because part of the problem of being a Binturong fan is simply that it is hard to find good Binturong stuff because yeah. of all the reasons that you just said. And and you have all kinds of good Binturong stuff uh, up nice. here. <laughs> um, I really love it. And so you're doing two different things, which I found interesting. You're doing a raffle or mm -hmm. just a sale of, of the products. So um, can you kind of explain what those two things are and like what products you have available? Yeah, of course. So my whole thing um, with this fundraiser as well was I wanted it to be that anybody could potentially contribute. Um, we all are living in a in a time that there's not a lot of spare money around and we have to be careful, um, which I can completely um, sympathize, with as, uh, sympathize with as well. Um, so I wanted it to be made available to, to everyone because there's nothing worse when you see a fantastic cause that you want to support, but maybe you've seen an item that's a little bit out of your price range and you're actually kind of like, I'd love to be able to do that, but I just can't. Um, so I came up with the idea of the raffle um, in the hopes that even just um, that for, for three pounds, someone can buy, buy one ticket, but they could potentially win the ultimate bundle. And that's one of every item that I've made. Um, and it means that you've, you've got a chance of getting it just for three pounds or you can prefer um, to buy it individually. So if there's actually only one particular product that you're kind of crazy over and um, you can just get that one um, rather than potentially buying um, a few raffles and um, not maybe getting the, the one that you want but um, yeah so I came up with a couple of different ideas I thought um, I haven't sewn since I was like 15 <laughs> um, so I uh, asked my gran if I could borrow her sewing machine which she was ecstatic about <laughs> and um started that is such a grandmother thing that's <laughs> <Yes>. so funny <laughs> yeah it, it, she it was the, the second that was asked it was like yep take it there you go fantastic go for it um so <laughs> um yeah it, it's been nice actually getting back in the way of it and so as i say they're they're not the products are not perfect <laughs> um it's not sort of something that you could um passes um expertise but i think they're they're nice wee additions um so one of the items is a binturong cushion um and it's a 14 inch square with a kind of nice almost rainbow-esque um binturong on the front um i've also got some key rings that features um a little um binturong image on one side and then actually a photo of poppy and ali on the the other side and then we've got some stickers of some cute 
Binturong art and then also a World Binturong Day badge um, that has a little Binturong on it that's holding a wee globe and that can also be in a sticker form as well and then we also have um, some water bottles as well which actually has some interesting um, facts on the front of it um, about the Binturong including its um, its uh, conservation status and then on the opposite side of it it actually has the paw print um, from either Poppy or Ali um, so it's a nice little sort of personal Binturong paw um, for you on your water bottle. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. What if I told you scientists discovered a hundred new species in the deep ocean? Why did crocodiles survive extinction? Megalodon, how did it go extinct? Hey, it's me, Forrest Galante, wildlife biologist. You might know me from Joe Rogan's podcast or my various TV shows like Extinct or Alive and Shark Week. Join me and my friends as we dive into the wild world of animal anomalies and everything wildlife. Don't miss out. Click here to uncover these mind-blowing animal mysteries. Yes, which I I think is ridiculous. I think that is... I, I, I was already excited about just who doesn't want a Binturong water bottle in their life. Yeah. Uh, but then I saw the paw print and I was like, well, that now makes it emotional too. So yeah, yeah that was very cool. And actually, you, you, you forgot one other thing. You, you also have some plushes available. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so um, there's little mini plushes about, available as well. They're sort of like 14 centimetres long. Um, so whilst we're not advocating that Binturongs make great pets because, you know, they, they demand respect as well, and there's definitely that mutual respect there, um, but you can contribute to a fantastic cause with AB Conservation, but have your own little mini um, plushy Binturong um, in, your, in your own home that will not wreck your house or um, wreck you. <laughs> um, yeah. Because whilst um, they do smell of popcorn, that smell does... What's the word? <laughs> the uh, novelty of it wears, <laughs> shall we say. Fair. Well, um, and it also is a smell that's coming from, like, their urine. And so, exactly. you know, there's a whole lot of pee if you try and bring a binturong into your house. Um, exactly. Yeah, they yes. are. I love them so much, and I would never have one as a pet. Yeah, <laughs> I will tell you, I will have all the plush ones available. And for my yeah. listeners in the U.S., um, there is shipping available to the U.S. And it, it's yep. not devastatingly expensive. Um, but one thing that is worth mentioning is that you cannot get any of this merch over here, even the plush Binturong. And I'm very aware of every plush Binturong in the <laughs> United States right now because I have them all. Um, but this is one that you cannot get in the United States. So if you are a Binturong lover, if you are a person that loves plushies, if you like unique things, uh, this is a great opportunity to get, you know, one of those. And then all of the other items are obviously very unique to this and very special, which I think is is very important to point out and which I had to point out because Kirsty is from the UK and people over there <laughs> like to be very humble. So as I was listening to you talk about all of those things, Kirsty, and you're like, yeah, they're not perfect. And I'm like, shut <laughs> up. They look amazing. I've seen the pictures. <laughs> Don't dissuade people from doing this. <laughs> 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 that's very kind i know but um yeah it's I, I i've really enjoyed doing it and the response that i've had has has been fantastic so far and um everybody's been happy with everything so um hopefully that's a good sign and, and more things to come and um yeah we're we're kind of trying to to get the word out about binturongs and also raise as much money as possible for for ab conservation um because they're just a fantastic project and um, can help save this sort of real life mythical creature. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, binturongs are, uh, they're just, they're so unique. And one thing, and, you know, uh, listeners who have been listening for a while, I know you've heard this before, but um, it's, it's always so cool. But like, binturongs for me are the way that I came to understand what a prehensile tail actually means. Yeah. Um, like, I know, I knew the word obviously. But having a binturong on my shoulders and then using its tail around my neck to like adjust and feeling all of the little miniature muscles move. I always kind of pictured it like a human arm where there were like a couple joints or what. I, I don't know what I really pictured. But the way that their tails move is uh, just like it's, it's astonishing. Prehensile tails are the coolest thing. 
Yeah, they they really are, and how they would use them, and even in captivity as well, um, the the natural behaviour is still there, and um, also on an individual basis as well. Um, so Poppy, she would always um, kind of walk, and her tail would be in line with her body, so it would be off the ground, um, and you would kind of see at her um, if she was on the ground, she would be um, kind of creating only paw prints as she went. Um, whereas Ali was much more um, casual, shall we say. <laughs> um, so he would just let his tail trail behind him. Um, so quite often when you would um, throw the, the shavings down, uh, the sawdust down, um, and it would have a nice clean floor, um, Ali would have almost comical timing and be like, oh, you've just put them down. I'm going to come down to ground level. And you would just see his tail start to draw little patterns in the floor <laughs> um, because he would just rather let it um, drag behind him. But he would still use it in the branches. Um, but yeah, he didn't want to put that effort in when he was on the ground. <laughs> that's so funny. And that's one of my favorite things about this podcast is just getting to know the individual animals and like just the little differences between them. Like that is just so cute and so interesting to try and like get into their heads and wonder like why why poppy would always you know hold the tail up and and ali just was like buh <laughs> yeah <laughs> yep <laughs> that's really yeah. funny very cool um so how can people find this fundraiser so if they head to um, the official AB Conservation page and give them a like and follow, they can actually find out all about the, the conservation that they do. And there is a few posts on there about the fundraiser. Um, but on Facebook, if they head to AB Conservation Fundraiser, um, that is the name of the page um, or fundraising. And basically all they need to do is send a message to that page. There's a photo album that has everything that's for sale um, as well as the raffle, which is due to end um, on the evening of the 28th um, UK time. Um, but there will likely be another raffle. It might not be for the exact same things, um, but I do have one other item that I only have two of, and one of them has already been won. Um, so the second one will be going up just a few days before World Binturong Day. Um, so yeah, so if people are interested to find out about AB Conservation or want to um, take part in the, the fundraiser and donate, um, best bet is to head to, to Facebook and search for um, AB Conservation Fundraising. And um, yeah, just send me a message and it's it's me behind it. <laughs> so um, it'll be me that you're, you're chatting to. And um, I really want to give a shout out as well to people from all 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 different places across the world um so far that have got in touch and either just talked about the the wonders of Binturong uh, and also um or just donated as well whether it be through raffle tickets buying stuff or just a, a donation um i really appreciate it and i'm always always happy to be, uh, talk about all things Binturong so um so yeah um, best bets to to head over to there and I will also have links in my stories and in the show notes and all of those things because I highly encourage y'all to uh, help out with this this great cause. And I cannot believe that you are sitting here and telling me that there is a unique item and we don't even get to know what it is. You are such a tease. See, you say you don't do a lot of PR, but you're good at this because you have picked my interest. And I'm like, well, now I have to keep checking to see what that is. Well, you know, I have to keep some things under the hat. So, yes, yeah, stay stay tuned for that because um, the the kind of non official official end date is is World Binturong Day. Um, I'd like to do a sort of announcement then to see how much we have raised. Um, but items will be available uh, for the rest of the month if people are like, oh no, I missed out, and actually that was a fantastic cause or, oh, I meant to send them a message, but I never got around to it. Um, that page will still be there. I'll still be here um, shouting about Binturongs. So feel free to to um, send a message. Um, but yeah, we really want to get the, the word out um, before World Binturong Day and get people their badges so they can show with pride. <laughs> very, very cool. I do have one other Binturong discussion we have to get before we wrap things up, though, which is mm -hmm. you said something, and it is something that is commonly said, and I debated a little bit, but don't worry, this is all in good fun. Um, <laughs> you said that uh, Bintrongs smell like buttered popcorn. And I have to tell you, I've Apparently. met a lot of Bintrongs, I've seen a lot of Bintrongs, <laughs> I've held some Bintrongs. Um, 
only once in all of my time with Mintrongs did I go to a place and think, oh, this smells like buttered popcorn. And that was at Brookfield Zoo. Every other time, I I think they smell like corn chips, like Cheetos or Fritos. I don't know if y'all have those in the UK, but like, I don't know. It's not the same as like buttered popcorn to me. I know what like y'all are talking about. I don't know if it's my weird nose or not, but I always love asking people that are Bintarong fans this. Do you actually think they smell like buttered popcorn or do you think it's more of like a Cheetos, Fritos, corn chip, tortilla type thing? Yeah. So in a word for me, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Is this just a lie that we all tell everybody? <laughs> I mean, I I find it was um I found when you were further away there was definitely a hint of it and you could be like, "Oh, yeah, that that definitely smells of buttered popcorn." But for me when you actually enter the enclosure and you're cleaning it out, scrubbing it out and then you leave and Three hours later, you're in a different enclosure, but you can still smell very strong bintrong that does not smell of buttered popcorn. <laughs> um, then that's where I'm a little bit kind of like, mm, maybe, maybe not. Um, and I've done the same as well, where I've been like, is it my nose? Is it broken? Or is, um, yeah, so for me, I think from a distance, they they are they are buttered popcorn. <laughs> but um, the closer you get, the less it gets simpler. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I like to, I like to joke because when I went to Brookfield Zoo in Chicago and I've been there multiple times, and it's happened every time they have this amazing, it's very like deep. You're kind of in the middle of it when you're, you're looking in. So they go down and up and just very large binturong enclosure. And, um, it's the only time that like I walked up and I was like, the, this actually smells like popcorn. And then I started <laughs> joking, and it's obviously just a joke, that that the uh, the zoo is pumping the smell of, of <laughs> popcorn in there just to, you know, keep the rumor going. But obviously I'm kidding about that. But yeah. Um, so good. Okay. Well, thank you for your honesty about that. No problem. <laughs> um, so, um, okay. So uh, th- th- there's obviously one more thing that we need to do. So mm-hmm. it is time. It's time now, don't you know? We've come to the end of the show, but there's one tale left to go. You're gonna laugh and say, oh no, it's time for the Ron Safari Poop Story. Hello? Hello. So, yeah, sorry, I wasn't, I, from when I listened to it before, I heard the theme tune and stuff. So I was oh, just yeah, like, yeah, I had all that in yeah. afterwards. But thank you <laughs> for being so kind and waiting for the, <laughs> you know, if this was a professional <laughs> podcast, I would do that. But I'm just a goober <laughs> trying my best, so... <laughs> no, fair enough. I, I absolutely appreciate that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I love that you were waiting. That's great. I'm probably going to leave all this in because I think that's really funny. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Great. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so the poop stories. Poop story. So it's a little bit kind of indirect, um, but it is still a poop, I, what I would class as a poop story. Poop story. And controversially, it is not to do with Binturong. Okay, that's fine. So we're we're taking a left turn here. Um, so back when I was doing my internships, um, I was lucky enough to work with um, some black bears and they are definitely, um, bears are up there for me as well, um, hence why I love bear cats so much. Um, <laughs> so um, one day I was um, in the bear enclosure, the black bear was in the house chilling, eating his food quite happily whilst I was outside um, cleaning up his his business. And um, there was an area in the middle of the enclosure where it was a bit denser, a bit more shrubs. Um, so me being um, very committed and in it for the, the all experience, I was like, I feel like that's going to be a, a poop spot. And sure enough, it was. Um, so I went in through this shrub um, and it kind of engulfed me um, <laughs> when with my little black bag and uh, shovel in hand. And all of a sudden, all I could hear from the fence line was, oh wait 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 look look and I paused and I realized as I listened more there was a family who were stood there and they were like the bear's in there the bear's in there we've actually seen the bear the bear was me (laughs) so 
they thought that they were seeing the movement and the black of my bin bag and my work hoodie um, was what they were mistaking for a bear. And the sheer joy in their voice. And it wasn't one of those situations where it was someone going, oh, what's that funny animal? It was a genuine, um, they, they thought they were seeing the bear. <laughs> So what did I do? I stayed in the shrub. I did not come out and I waited for them to pass because I could not ruin their day by popping up and going, actually, it's just me. The bear's up there. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I was um, doing the, the pooper scooping in the shrubs whilst um, pretending to be a bear, technically. <laughs> That's amazing. I love it so much. Uh, well, thank you for doing this. Thank you for uh, the fundraiser and for trying to to raise awareness about binturongs and AB conservation and all of the things. No problem at all. And thank you so much for inviting me on and for all the support. And um, yeah, more than happy to, to chat about binturongs all day long. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so welcome to uh, the bonus contest part of this. Uh, so I'm I'm adding my own contest to this contest for the current raffle, which ends soon. Like this is dropping on Saturday night in the U.S. I believe it's it's almost Sunday morning now in the U.K. Uh, and this is ending Sunday night in the U.K. So you don't have a lot of time for the first raffle, um, but also for the next one that she'll be doing closer to uh, World Binturong Day. If you tell Kirsty you heard about or saw her fundraiser on Raw Safari, for every five raffle tickets you buy, you'll also get an entry to a Raw Safari raffle. And for every five pounds you spend buying merch, you'll get an entry to the Raw Safari raffle as well. Uh, three winners will be chosen uh, on World Binturong Day as part of this, and um, you'll get a uh, an adorable Binturong stuffy, different than the one that is uh, part of Kirsty's whole thing, and a couple of Binturong stickers from a zookeeper friend of mine that uh, does some amazing, amazing work. So um, I'll be posting more about that in stories, uh, on the gram, and on Facebook and everything. But yes, please go look at the socials. Go follow AB Conservation. Um, check my stories for the link to get involved with this fundraiser. And uh, you can also look at the show notes and and just get your butt out there and go and support Binturong Conservation, y'all, because Binturongs are incredible. And if we lose them, I'm going to cry a lot. You'll get an entire episode that's just going to be me crying, sadly. But uh, yeah, so um, thank you all for listening to this. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. I'd like to say a special word of thanks to my Red Panda level patrons, Dr. Laura Shank, Dr. Stephen Williamson, Barbara Bennett, and Jenny Owens. And remember, friends, the words Binturong Conservation backwards are Noit of Resnock, Gnoru Tnib. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.